At seven o'clock in the evening, after drinking tea, I departed from a post station, the name of which I don't remember, but I recollect it was somewhere in the military district of Don, near Novocherkask. It was already dark when, wrapped up in my furs, I sat down with Alec in the sledge. In the shelter of the post station it seemed warm and still. Although there was no snow above us, not a single tiny star was visible above our heads, and the sky appeared to be extraordinarily low and black in comparison with the pure snowy plain stretching out before us. We had scarce passed the dark figures of the mills, one of which was clumsily waving one of its huge wings, and got clear of the station when I observed that the road was heavier and more obstructed, and the wind began to blow upon my left side more violently and beat upon the flank, tail and mane of the horse, and regularly raise and carry away the snow torn up by the curved shafts of the sledge and the hoofs of the horses. A little sledge bell began to be silent, a current of cold air began to flow from some opening into my sleeve and down my back, and the advice of the inspector not to go at all, lest I should wander about the whole night and be frozen to death on the road, at once occurred to me. I went we lost our way, I said to the driver. I received an answer I repeated the question in still plainer form. Do you think we shall reach the post station, or shall we lose our way, driver? God knows, he replied, without turning his head. It's only human to go astray, and the road is nowhere visible, my little master. Will you tell me whether you think we shall get to the post station or not? I continued to ask. Shall we get there, I say? We ought to get there, said the driver, and he murmured something else which I couldn't quite catch because of the wind. I didn't want to turn back, but to wander about all night in the frost and snow in the absolutely barren steppe as this part of the military district of Don really is was also not a very pleasant prospect to contemplate. Moreover, although I was unable to examine him very well in the darkness, my driver, somehow or other, did not please me, nor did he inspire me with confidence. He sat squarely instead of sideways, his body was too big, his voice had too much of a drawl, his head somehow or other. It wasn't the driver's head, it was too big and bulgy, he didn't urge on the horses as he should have done, he held the reins in both hands as a lackey does, who sits on the box behind the coachman and above all I did not believe in him, because his ears were tied round with the cloth. In a word, I didn't like the look of him and that serious hunched back of his bobbing up and down before me bought it no good. In my opinion, it would be better to turn back, said Alec. It's no joke to get lost. My little master, you see what sort of driving it is. No road to be seen. Your eyes are plunged up, growled the driver. We hadn't gone a quarter of an hour when the driver stopped the horses, gave the reins to Alec, clumsily disengaged his legs from their sitting position and trampling over the snow and his big boots went to try and find the road. I say, where are you? I cried. Have we gone astray or what? But the driver didn't answer me, and turning his face in the opposite direction to that in which the wind was blowing, it had cut him in the very eyes, went away from the sledge. Well, what is it? I asked when he had turned back again. Nothing at all, said he with sudden impatience and anger as if it was my fault that he had lost the road, and slowly thrusting his big boots into the front part of the sledge again, he slowly grasped the reins together with his frozen mittens. What shall we do? I asked when we had again moved forward. Do? Why go whither God allows us? And on we went, at the same jig trot, obviously across the country, sometimes over snow piled up bushels high, sometimes over brittle naked ice. Notwithstanding the cold, the snow on our collars thawed very quickly. The snow drift below increased continually, and fine dry flakes began to fall from above. It was plain we were going God only knew whither, for after going alone for another quarter of an hour we didn't see an angle where it lost. What do you think, huh? I said again to the driver. Do you think we shall get to the station? Which station? We may get back. If the horses take it into their heads to try they will take us right enough, but as to reaching the other station scarcely, we might perish, that's all. Then turn back by all means, said I, at any rate. Turn the horses round, you mean? Yes, turn them round. 
The driver let go of the reins. Horses began to run more quickly, and although I observed that we had turned round, yet the wind had changed too, and soon through the snow the windmills were visible. The driver took heart again and began to be loquacious. The Anudius got into the drift and turned back just in the same way they came from the station, said he, and passed the night by the haystacks. They only got in by morning. They were only too thankful for the shelter of the haystacks. They might have easily frozen to death. It was cold, and one of them did have his legs frostbitten, so that he died of it three weeks later. But now do you see it's not so cold and has grown quiet and might not be dry on, huh? It's fairly warm, yeah, and the snow is coming down now. We'll turn back as it seems easier going and the snow comes down thicker. You might drive it if you had a courier, but you'll do it at your own risk. You joking? Why, you'd be frozen. What should I say who am responsible for your honor? Just then there was a sound of little bells behind us, the bells of some troika, three-horse sledge, which was rapidly overtaking us. That's a courier's bell, said my driver. There is one such courier at every post station. And indeed the little bell of the front troika, the sound of which was now plainly borne to us by the wind, was an extraordinary welcome sound to hear pure musical sonorous and slightly droning sound. As I afterwards ascertained, it was Hunter's arrangement of three little bells, one big one in the center and two little ones adjusted to tears. The sound of these tears and the droning quint resounding through the air was extraordinarily penetrating, strangely pleasant in that last and voiceless step. The post is in haste, said my driver, and the foremost of the three horses was level with us. What sort of a road, eh? Can one get through? cried he to the hindmost driver, but the fellow only shouted to his horses and didn't answer for him. The sound of the little bells quickly died away on the wind as soon as the postcard had passed us. My driver must now have felt a bit ashamed, I fancy. We'll go on, sir, said he. These people have gone on before us and have left fresh track, which we can now follow. I agreed, and again we turned towards the wind and crawled along a bit through the deep snow. I kept a silent glance upon the road so as to see that we did not wander away from the track made by the sledge. For two years the track was plainly visible. After that, the only thing observable was a very slight unevenness under the curved sides of the sledge, and I began to look straight in front of me. The third worst pall we could still make out, but the fourth we could not find at all. As before, we were driving both against and with the wind both left and right, and at last it got to such a pass that the driver said we had deviated to the right. I said we had gone to the left, while Alec proved that we were absolutely going back again. Once more we stopped for a while, the driver extricated his big feet and crawled out to find the road, but it was all in vain. I also made up my mind to get out for once and see for myself whether that was not the road which I saw glimmering indistinctly. But scarcely had I taken six steps forward with the utmost difficulty against the wind and persuaded myself that everywhere were the self-same uniform white layers of snow and that the road existed only in my imagination that I no longer saw the sledge. Driver? Alec? I cried, but my voice... Well, I felt that the wind snatched it right out of my mouth and carried it in the twinkling of an eye away from me. I have a very distinct recollection of the loud, penetrating and even desperate voice with which I once more yelled, Driver, when he was only two good paces distant from me. His black figure, whip in hand and with his large head perched on one side, suddenly grew up in front of me. He led me to the sledge. Still warm, thank goodness, said he. But it's bad if the frost does catch you, my little master, said he. Let the horses go, we must go back, said I, taking my seat on the sledge. Suppose you can guide them, driver. I must guide them. He threw aside the reins, struck the saddle of the seal horse thrice with his whip, and again we went on some weather for a bit. We went alone for about half an hour. Suddenly we again heard in front of us the to me familiar little hunting bell and two more besides, but this time they were coming towards us. It was the same three troikas returning to the post station after delivering the mails, with the fresh horses fastened on behind. The curious troika with its three powerful horses with the hunting bells came rapidly forward, 
single driver sat on the box shouting lustily. Behind in the middle of the empty sledge sat a couple drivers. I could hear the loud and merry discourse. One of them was smoking a pipe, and the sparks, kindled by the wind, lit up part of his face. As I looked at them I began to be ashamed that I had been afraid to go on, and my driver must have experienced much the same sensation, for we said with one voice, let's go after them. The hindmost troikas had not yet passed when my driver turned clumsily and struck the attached horses with the sledge shafts. One of the troika team thereupon fell heavily, tearing away the traces and plunging to one side. You cockeyed devil, don't you see where you're going driving over people like that devil tech you? began one of the drivers in a hoar, quavering voice. He was smallish and an old fellow, as far as I could judge from his voice and his position. He'd been sitting in the hinder troika, but now leaped quickly out of the sledge and ran to the horses, never ceasing the whole time to curse my driver in the most coarse and cruel manner. But the horses would not be pacified. The driver ran after them, and in a minute both horses and driver had vanished in the white mist of the snowstorm. Vasily, bring the chestnut hither. We shall never get the miles, his voice still resounded. One of the drivers, a very tall man, got out of the sledge, silently detached his three horses, saddled and bridled one of them, and, crunching the snow beneath him, disappeared in the direction of his comrade. We, with the two other horses, went after the curious troika, which, ringing its bell, set off in front at full gallop. We just let ourselves go without troubling any more about the road. Pretty way of catching them, said my driver, alluding to the other driver, who had gone off after the horses. He'll never catch them. He's leading the spare horse to a place he'll never get him out of it again. Ever since my driver had begun to go back, he had become in better spirits and more inclined to be talkative, which I, of course, did not fail to take advantage of, as so far I had no desire to sleep. I began to ask him all about himself and whence he came, and soon found out that he was a fellow countryman, hailing from Tula country being a small proprietor in the village of Kirpichny, that their land was of very little good to them and had quite ceased to produce grain since the Halera visitation, that there were two brothers at home, while the third had enlisted as a soldier, that the supply of bread would not hold out till Christmas, and they had to hire themselves out to make more money, that the younger brother was master in the house because he was married, while my friend was a widower, that an artel or society of drivers went forth from their village every year that though he was not a coachman by profession he served at the post station in order to be of some help to his brother that he lived here thank god on 120 paper rubles a year of which he sent hundreds home to his family that he had a pretty good time of it but that couriers were veritable beasts and that the people he had to do with here were always cursing him that driver, for instance, why should he curse me, my little master? Did I overturn his horses on purpose? Why, I wouldn't do any harm to anyone. And why should he go scaring after them? They would be sure to come back of their own accord, and now he'll only make the horses starve to death besides coming to grieve himself, repeated the God-fearing little mujik. But what is that black thing yonder? said I, observing some black object just in front of us. A train of wagons, nice way of going alone, I must say continued he when he had come abreast with the huge wagons covered with mats going one after another on wheels. Look, not a soul to be seen. They're all asleep. Horse is the wisest of them all. He knows very well what he's about. Nothing in the world will make him miss the road. We too will go alongside of them, and then we shall be all right, added he, and know where we are going. It really was a curious sight. There were those huge wagons covered with snow from the matching atop to the wheels below, moving alone, absolutely alone. Only in the front corner the snow-covered mat was raised a couple of inches for a moment as our little bells resounded close to the wagons and had popped up. The big piebald horse with outstretched neck and straining back deliberately proceeded along the absolutely hidden road monotonously shaking his shaggy head beneath the whitening shaft and pricking up one snow-covered ear as we came abreast of him. After we had gone on for another half hour, the drivers again turned to me. What do you think, sir? Are we going too nicely alone enough? I don't know, I replied. Before the wind was anyhow, but now we're going right in the midst of the storm, 
No, we shall not get there. We too have lost our way, he concluded with the utmost calmness. Evidently, although a great coward and afraid of his own shadow, he had become quite tranquil as soon as there were a good many of us together, and he was not obliged to be our guide and responsible for us. With the utmost thing, Freud, he criticized the mistake of the driver in front of us as if it had anything whatever to do with him. I observed indeed that now and then the Troika in front was sometimes in profile, from my point of view, to the left, and sometimes to the right, and it also seemed to me as if we were encircling a very limited space. However, it might have been an optical delusion as also the circumstance that occasionally it seemed to me as if the Troika in front was climbing up a mountain, or going along a declivity, or under the brow of a hill, whereas the step was everywhere uniformly level. After we had proceeded for some time longer, I observed, or so it seemed to me, far away on the very horizon, a long black moving strip of something, but in a moment it became quite plain to me that this was the very same train of wagons which we had overtaken and outstripped. Just the same creaking wheels, some of them no longer turning and enveloped in snow, just the same people asleep beneath their mats, and just the same leading five bull horse with steaming descended nostrils smelling out the road and pricking up his ears. Look, we've gone round and round and are coming out by this train of wagons again, said my driver in a sulky tone. The courier's horses are good ones, though he drives them obediently, but ours are so-so and always stopping just as if we had been driving all night alone. He coughed a bit. Shall we turn off somewhere, sir, for our sins? Why, we're bound to arrive somewhere as it is. Arrive somewhere. We shall have to make night of it in this step. That's what we shall do. How is it snowing, my little master? Although it did seem strange to me that the driver in front of us, who had obviously lost his road and had no idea of the direction in which he was going, took no trouble to find it again, but continued to drive at full tilt, cheerily shouting to his horses, I didn't want to separate from him all the same. Follow after them, I said. The driver went on, but he drove along even more unwillingly than before and no longer conversed with me.